Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, have the opportunity to talk about adrenal cancer. Uh, I've had an interest in adrenal cancer for at least 20 years and have been banking every adrenal cancer that's come through the University of Michigan for, for all those years. So it's great to see all that effort of banking uh, come to some, some benefit. So uh, it's a really rare cancer, only one or two cases per, uh, per million per year. So there's only about 500 cases uh, in the United States a year. The outcome is quite variable, and it, of course, uh, like all cancers, is dependent on both the tumor grade and stage. What's interesting is it can be associated with various uh, clinical endocrinopathies, such as hypercortisolism, uh, otherwise known as Cushing syndrome. Um, the therapeutic options are kind of limited. And so uh, having better ideas about how to approach this therapeutically is certainly one of our tasks in this project. And uh, fortunately, I'm at one of the places that have set up multidisciplinary clinics, one of which is here at the NIH with Tito Fojo uh, and others, uh, but Michigan and MD Anderson. So uh, we see a lot of patients come through Ann Arbor, even though you know they're from New York or overseas. Um, the first thing to point out, and I'll, I'll spend a little time quickly on some background. And uh, uh, these can be massive tumors. This one is a 20 centimeter tumor. Um, usually they're about eight centimeters and above, and so they can get even larger than this. So the first thing to notice is that there's an opportunity for heterogeneity. So this is all necrosis, and so all these clones are popping up, and they can be quite different. So the, the first thought is that the notion that you're going to put a needle in this clone and, and just understand everything about the tumor is kind of naive when you're talking about a 20 centimeter tumor. Um, you know, this is a little controversial, but adrenal cancers just don't come from anywhere. They come usually from, in my opinion, pre-existing benign tumors like this one, which is only less than two centimeters, it is an adenoma. So I believe in an adenoma to a carcinoma progression, and the molecular data is starting to fill that in, even though there's some people that are hesitant uh, to believe this. The histopathology in most cases is really not that difficult. This is an adenoma. The cells are very differentiated. They have tons of uh, intracellular lipid and gives us clear, uh, clear appearance. Uh, and cancers are much more cellular, have necrosis, nuclear pleomorphism, and mitosis. So the pathology is pretty well worked out, but as you'll see, there's, there's some challenges in the pathology. And honestly, like a lot of cancers, uh, resection is the only curative treatment. So we, we try to resect as many people as possible, um, but uh, in many cases, it's, it's not possible. Uh, so stage, pretty simple. Tumors less than five centimeters confined to the adrenal, these are quite rare. Uh, stage two, more than five centimeters, also confined to the adrenal, and then locally invasive and uh, dis uh, distant metastatic disease. So pretty simple staging. And grading is actually not architectural. So a lot of times when you talk about tumor grade, it's like does it form glands or are there squamous pearls? In adrenal cancer, it doesn't really do any of that. There are no glands. It just grows in solid sheets, right? So solid sheets of tumor cells. So we actually have developed a mitotic grading. Uh, and we count mitoses, less than 20 is low grade, greater than 20 is high grade. And so you can see the, the stark difference between a low grade ACC and a high grade ACC. And this will come through in the, in the genomic data. And there's clearly a range of morphologies. So an exceptionally low grade tumor without mitotic activity or necrosis, a more cellular tumor now with mitotic figures, and then probably the most extreme manifestation, an extremely high grade tumor where you can see one, two, you know, three, probably four mitotic figures and several apoptotic bodies scattered about two. So an extremely high grade tumor. Um, so we have a full range of biology. And then back to that intratumoral heterogeneity, you can actually see it histologically. So this is the same tumor, a low grade tumor with a low proliferation index. Uh, almost, if it would all look like this, I might be tempted to call it benign, an adenoma, but nonetheless it has areas that are more cellular with a higher proliferation rate. So clearly we have uh, a big sampling issue here for, for these tumors. So what are the challenges? Occasionally they're still diagnostically difficult cases and uh, overall prognostic assessment. Low grade, high grade is not the, you know, it's not that granular. Could we do better? And then prediction and risk assessment, both of who's going to recur locally, who's going to uh, spread distantly, who's going to respond to, you know, chemotherapy might attain some of the therapies that we have. And then uh, related to that, what are some uh, other therapeutic options that we could, could bring to bear? So, so those are the challenges that we sort of went into this TCGA project. Oops, that is not right. 
Oh, something's out of order there. Okay, but, um, and so what's nice is that you'll see, oh no, I'm sorry, I am mistaken. So what's happening is there's this merging molecular classification. Some of the work from my lab and others from the uh, NSAT group, the European Network for the Study of Adrenal Tumors, uh, in, uh, in Europe, obviously, that we can separate adenomas from good prognosis and poor prognosis cancers, and then some of the parameters that are driving this classification, and you can start to see p53 and beta catenin mutations. Um, but what's nice about this field is that there's a really strong genotype-phenotype correlation. Uh, and so this uh, merging molecular classification is in pretty good agreement with this low-grade, high-grade classification, right? So it's sort of, uh, it's, even though it's a, um, a big range of biology, it's kind of a more simpler cancer, so it's really well suited towards genomic studies. Okay, on to our project. So we had a global cohort. Uh, we needed a global cohort to get enough cases. So we had North America, South America, Europe, and Australia. We ended up with about 92. One had prior chemo, one out. One out. Um, we did a superset for sequencing, and then about, uh, up to about 80 cases passed RNA, we lost that one. So we had a pretty good cohort for such a rare disease. Uh, first, first snippet of data, uh, mutation density. Uh, as Gaddy will tell you, I, you know, I pushed really hard on the thyroid project to, to look at mutation density. We discussed it many times, but uh, I, think it's, I think it's useful. So right smack in the middle of this, of this plot, um, and, and it shows you can see a broad range of, of mutation density. And we tried actually to, um, to make something of this. So we looked at muta mutation density quite formally, and you can see the high, uh, intermediate, and low, and actually there's a fair number of things that correlate quite strongly with mutation density. This is all stages, and then we look just at, at organ-confined disease, stage one and stage two, because those are the ones where you'd want to make a decision, do I treat this patient, do I watch this patient? And so even in, even in organ-confined disease, you can see that there's a big range of mutation density uh, from high to low, and then again, some of these, uh, ex these molecular correlates are shining through. So there's, it just tells us there's an opportunity uh, to use mutation density uh, to, to, to do things clinically, or just more broadly that, you know, the accumulation of mutations is clearly a, a bad thing in this cancer. Uh, onto significantly mutated genes, uh, usual characters, beta catenin, p53, uh, MEN1. Um, in pretty much uh, expected frequencies, I guess with MEN being uh, more than we expected. This is a shock. This is the regulatory subunit of protein kinase A, and this is, this, mutations of this gene are associated with Carney's complex and a rare uh, adrenal disease called PPNAD, primary pigmented nodular adrenal cortical disease, and it's really not cancer, and rarely do those turn into cancers, um, but yet here we have uh, several mutations in this gene. Uh, so that's, a, that's a, not a shock, but it's much higher frequency than expected. And then RPL22, which, which is, uh, interferes, inter uh, relates with uh, P53, and that's novel for this, for this disease. Um, so we spent a lot of time looking for gene fusions, hoping that uh, gene fusions like in thyroid would, would explain some of the cases that don't have obvious mutations. So we were very excited about this. I hired a summer student. We built tissue microarrays so we could do fish. Uh, we used two methods with, with Rolver Hake. We found lots of fusions, 156 and 48 of the, of the tumors, and there's supporting data that they're real from copy number. However, there were not a, not a single recurrent fusion. So we decided, you know, doing fish to validate this was a big waste of time, and we put the arrays aside for another project. Um, so that was a little bit of a disappointment, but some of them are quite interesting uh, in which they are, are known uh, cancer genes like mTOR, and so it's possible that fusions play a minor role in this disease, uh, creating these private fusions. Um, we then turn to copy number, and so this is data from uh, old CGH from circa 2000, and you can see there's lots of gains and losses in adrenal cancer. So we were expecting to see something, and sure enough, we did. We, here's the focal changes, uh, TERT and CDK4, TERF2, which we think may be unique within TCGA, um, CCNE1, and on the deletion side, we have RB, and ZN, ZNR, ZNRF3, which is a regulator of um, the, the Wnt pathway and thought to be an alternative way to, 
to inactivate the wind pathway. So this was confirmatory because the NSAT group had already published that. So, so this was interesting with some, some novel changes. Um, but uh, So here's TURF2, and it just provides more evidence for the role of telomeres in, in adrenal cancer. Um, here's ZN, ZNRF3 deletion. It's a negative regulator of wind signaling. So the, the hypothesis is that deletion represents an alternative way in addition to APC and beta catenin mutations. And so Gary Hammer, uh, our other co-chair in this project, his lab is starting to work on this in a, in a mechanistic fashion. And it's present in about 20% of adrenal cancers. So here's the, the wind, and you can start to see, it starts to add up between APC and ZNRF3 and beta catenin. You can start to see it's almost about half of the cases that have some sort of wind pathway defect. Um, more copy number. So copy number defines different classes of ACC. We have a few cases that we call quiet that are uh, diploid, and then you can see uh, all hell goes, you know, everything goes to hell, and we have hypodiploid cases and hyperdiploid cases with whole genome doubling, uh, noisy, and a chromosomal group, and it turns out that the noisy tumors in both the, the uh, with and without whole genome doubling are the most aggressive, okay? So that was kind of interesting. Uh, we then put this in context of a pan cancer, and we looked at our ploidy data here uh, relative to what was available. And here's thyroid, which, uh, if you may remember, has a very quiet genome. And then uh, chromophobe kidney, again, with this hypodiploid. So you can see the big range in ploidy present in this cancer. And it's not really related to any type of purity because adrenal cancers, as I showed histologically, are really quite pure. So. So this is a really true biological uh, observation. Um, we then turn to molecular classification. Uh, we have two large classes shown here, and then four more granular uh, classes uh, with profound differences, both uh, in survival, shown here, and in endocrinopathy uh, and endocrine function. So this is uh, recapitulate some of the work that my lab did through the Director's Challenge Grant on adrenal cancers years ago. Uh, methylation. We have uh, three classes, again, with survival differences and other associations coming through. And then we, uh, the NSAT data was available. We took the NSAT data, showed that they're similar, uh, and uh, Luda distilled um, a nice, uh, uh, Luda and others distilled a nice 68 probe uh, methylation signature to show that we could get three classes and, and validated it with the NSAT data. So we did this in response to reviewers asking, well, you know, how are you going to uh, really distill this into the clinic. So this is one possible method for uh, clinical translation. Uh, but we really like this result, or I really like this result, this cluster of cluster analysis with the different clusters here and the associated data and this very nice result. And remember, I told you, we do low grade, high grade, you know, which is basically, you know, low grade, high grade. So if we could actually go from a two class prognostication to a three class, it would actually benefit, you know, what we do in, the, in, tumor, in weekly tumor boards. All right, so I'm excited about this, uh, and you can see some interesting associations with, with beta catenin. Most of the beta cat mutations are in the more aggressive clusters. Um, so this is, uh, you know, I'll talk more about this, is what I'm going to focus on as a pathologist going forward, and how do we translate this three class uh, into the clinic. So this is a really busy slide. It's our, our sort of supervised landscape view where we have the three cluster of clusters, all the associated mutations. Um, all the different uh, clinical and other genomic data, and then some interesting things. And I'll just point out a few things. Everyone can look at their favorite gene. But we have a group here that are sort of, um, you know, free of mutations. And so the question to me is, Tom, are you sure they're, too, you're sure they're cancers? And uh, because I told you sometimes we, we, ha we struggle. And I would argue that they are. And uh, the reason is, is because here's IGF-2 expression. And it's well known that IGF-2 expression is, is only seen in cancers and goes up quite substantially. And so all these tumors here that don't have drivers clearly have high IGF-2 expression. And some of the ones that don't are actually in some of the more aggressive clusters. So I think that's pretty strong evidence that, in fact, they are cancers. They're just devoid of drivers. And it also speaks to the fact that IGF-2 is probably the main driver in these tumors. Here's KI-67, and you can see that these are sort of the most low-grade tumors in terms of uh, their proliferation, because KI-67 and mitotic counts correlate with each other. So, so we're sniffing out 
the earliest form of adrenal cancer, which I think is quite, quite interesting. And then you can see the accumulation of mutations as you go from cluster one to cluster two to cluster three, uh, and then a few other things in here. Notice, though, the fusions, I was hoping the fusions might concentrate in there, but they don't. And so, you know, you have great ideas, but sometimes they work out. So I think this is a great figure. I think it will be really well received by the, the adrenal cancer community. We did a lot. I don't have much more time, but we did a lot. We looked at uh, telomere length at the suggestion of Matthew Meyerson. Um, I always like to put things in the context of our clinicians, so we, we developed this adrenal differentiation score that sort of puts the genomic data in the context of adrenal function and, you know, uh, um, and endocrinopathies. We did HotNet, sorry, HotNet2, file, Oncosign, and then pan-cancer genomic processes. I don't have time to, I apologize, I don't have time to show you all of these. But I'll show you the, the telomere length analysis. I think it worked out pretty well. Uh, this was done by uh, Siwan Zhang and Rolver Ro Hake, in which they, they did sort of off-target uh, sequencing. They took that data, and don't ask me the details, but they, they took the whole, ex whole exome data and, met, and got uh, telomere length data shown here, and then they validated it with some glioma data where they had whole genomes. And so there's some supporting evidence that this is believable. Uh, and then on top of that, you can see where the telomere length is increasing. We have enrichment of ATRX and DAX mutations and also MLL, and suggests that alternative lengthening of telomeres is in play for adrenal cancer in a subset of tumors. So, Matthew, thank you for the suggestion. I think it worked out pretty well, and we bumped this up to one of the main figures in the paper. Um, and then finally, we, because we knew that there were other papers, we really wanted to take advantage of the pan-cancer data. So we actually closed the paper with a pan-cancer analysis in which we looked at all the different classes of, of mutations that define oncogenic processes and were able to put adrenal cancer in largely three of them uh, shown here. And, and this is more interesting where you can now plot it, this, this big C of this plot where you have the mismatch repair signature, a smoking signature from lung cancer, and you can now see that adrenal cancer looks more like a, a scatter plot, but nonetheless, there are some cases that are in the mismatch repair signature. We had published within a year or two ago that adrenal cancer is part of Lynch syndrome and that they rarely do have uh, uh, germline mutations of, of mismatch repair genes. So this uh, confirms what we published. Uh, and, and more importantly, though, there, there was some suggestion in the literature that, it, that smoking may play a role. And so here we now have some data that, at least in some cases, that smoking may play um, a causative role. So, that's, we put that in there. It's a little speculative. We tried to get TCGA data, the smoking history, to sort of corroborate that and sort of quickly gave up because it just became too difficult. Um, so what have, we, what have we done in the last minute? We created, I think, an outstanding genomic resource for adrenal cancer research. We do have new somatic alterations. We expanded the role of, of WINT. The HotNet analysis really put, pulled that together nicely. Um, we have this copy number and whole genome doubling story that is quite elegant and well done. This copy number, this cluster of cluster analysis with three classes of tumors, which I really think will be advanced for the field. We did the pan cancer analysis. Um, the papers, uh, honestly, was were rejected from Nature Genetics, but we've repealed and they've they said, you know, actually you made some good points. So we're hopeful that um, we'll have a chance with Nature Genetics, and we're getting ready to send it back probably next week. Um, so looking forward, as I said. I will be looking for ways to deliver this three-class solution to routine cases, because how it works now is very few people get operated on at Michigan, but they all show up at our door with the paraffin blocks, and I need to, you know, if I'm going to do something, if we're going to be a center of excellence, I need to do something. And so how can we deliver this to those patients? And then therapy. I, th I think it's clear, though, that IGF-2 is still there. We've run IGF-2 trials. We only have a few responders. In the eyes of Big Pharma, they failed, but nonetheless, there are patients in there. And what I think what I think is happening, this is a little speculation, allow me to do this, those quiet cases I think are the ones that are responding to the IGF-2 inhibition. And once you accumulate all those other mutations, that signal sort of gets drowned out. Um, but I think the combination of IGF-2 and WINT I think holds the secret for treating high-grade adrenal cancer. Uh, I understand how hard it is to develop good inhibitors of beta-catenin. Um, so I'm not hopeful this is going to happen anytime soon, but I think the paper is telling us what we have to do. Uh, and then there's other pathways in, sm in smaller subsets. Um, this was uh, a huge amount of work uh, led uh, my co-chair by Rolver Hake and 
his postdoc, Siwon Zhang. Uh, he did a phenomenal job. And then, of course, the many other people that contribute to this. We really did, oh, look at that, right on time. Um, we really did uh, gather the world's group of endocrinologists to work on this. And my co-chair, Gary Hammer, and I were chatting when we started. I said, if we're all talking to each other at the end of this, it'll be a miracle. Um, but we've sort of done it, and there's really nobody annoyed with each other. Even though, you know, some of the issues of authorship have surfaced, but I was able to sort of tamp them down, you know, without causing too much trouble. And then just many other people from the TSS, the program office, and then I just have to give a shout out to Kenna, because when, you know, the TCJ announced rare project, I kept jumping up and down, and let's do adrenal cancer, and, you know, at first it was like, okay, Tom, that's great, but she did listen, and so we got it done. Thank you very much. Sort of a whirlwind tour. Uh, great presentation. Uh, we always have a problem of distinguishing adenoma from carcinoma in the adrenal gland. The old classification involved five centimeter size or some arbitrary things like that. Are we any better in defining what is a carcinoma? Yeah, so the, clinically they've gotten much better. There's uh, the radiologists do uh, dedicated adrenal scans, they do this washout. Um, they look for heterogeneity. Um, so having said that, you know, st it's still a mystery at surgery sometimes, right? So I think pathologically we've gotten much better, right? So there's, there's this mystique, which I think you might be referring to in the path literature. You go back 30, 40 years, people said you couldn't tell adrenal adenomas and carcinomas. But I think, you know, the work of Larry Weiss and other groups have really sort of distilled the histologic features down. So Truthfully, it's not that hard. Most of the cases that cross my desk um, are pretty straightforward. Now, but again, I'm, I'm in a unique situation that I get to see two of these a week, whereas most private practice pathologists will see one every couple of years. So it's a, I benefit from that. The second part is you described uh, beta catenin mutations. Does it affect the localization of beta catenin? Oh, yes. So, uh, so what we're doing now is we're actually looking carefully at the ZNRF3 mutations to see what the localization in those cases looks like because um, they, it's clear that they don't look, you saw with beta cat you get a strong nuclear signal. You don't necessarily get that, so it may mean that the, the wind signaling is, you know, not as potent in the ZNRF3 mutation. So we're, we're exploring that with our tissue arrays that we didn't use for the fish studies. Yes? Do you have any information on intratumor heterogeneity and does that affect prognosis? No, so that's my next project, right, is to wait for a big 20-centimeter tumor and sample it in 15 spots and then, you know, uh, get roll to construct the, you know, the evolution of the a mutation. So that's there. Unfortunately, I have many samples in the freezer, but nothing that's really tailored to try to reconstruct the evolution of a tumor. What I am collecting, though, are tumors that have both adenomas, what, I, what appear to be adenomas, and cancers, and uh, most of those are in paraffin, but I am collecting a series of those to try to build a molecular, you know, argument that this progression really does happen. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. And our second speaker, Tanya uh, Davidson from uh, NCI. She's going to talk about NCI Cloud Pilot report. 